Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to So Very Wrong About Games, a board gaming podcast about board games. I'm your co-host, Mark Bigney, a man of expanding body and contracting mind. And with me, as always, is my dear friend, Michael Walker, a man of... Well, when we find his mind, we'll let you know. How you doing, Walker? Good. Good, Mark. Good. (laughs) His eloquence never fails him. So, this is a board gaming podcast about board games. We're going to talk about board games this week in a radical departure from previous weeks. With great effort, I will attempt not to divert topics onto Norse mythology and or Macross or anything else that happens to be uh, a bugbear of mine. We're going to talk about the games we played last week. We're going to talk about the news and why it doesn't matter. And we're going to review our feature game this week, which is Dominant Species Marine by Chad Jensen. Aren't these guys getting, isn't this like the 164th week in a row that we've been doing board games? Aren't people getting kind of tired of that? I thought we were going to like move on eventually. Someday, Walker. Someday. What would you like to have a podcast about, Walker? <laughs> Butterflies. <laughs> Butterflies. <laughs> <laughs> what did you play this week, Walker? Well, we're going to start with a little racing segment, Mark, because I played two racing games and... I'm sure we can talk, or I can talk about Formula Day with my eyes closed. And so Formula Day came out in 1997. I know that when Formula Day comes out, I definitely shut my eyes as a defense mechanism. That's true. (laughs) And then I played a game called Automobiles that was by AEG, designed by David Short. It came out in 2000, sorry, in 2016. And then you and I played together, uh, I'm going to pronounce it this way, as in like a operating system. Okay. Uh, Cubit OS. I've heard it pronounced a number of different ways. Cubitos, Cubitos, Cubit. I, I like Cubitos because it's about throwing lots of dice, but anyway. Sure, let's go with that. This That's put out by John D. Clare, the same guy that did Mystic Veil vale and Space Base. I'm only going to uh, talk about, say those two because we won't talk about the other games that he put out. You don't want to talk about Edge of Darkness? No. Uh, so anyway... What are racing games, right? There are all of these games, I think, did a great job, and they're all like a push your luck. You know, try, you, they're trying to give you the feeling of a close race, of, you know, have a little bit of momentum and stress and, and flow of the game. And I think all of these games do it fairly well, but I think this new, uh, Cubitas does a, a fantastic job of keeping this, you know, very simple balance of of rolling dice, pushing your luck, moving around the track. The sort of the pure racing element is not really there. It's mostly just, you know, moving around to try to get bonuses, but you do eventually have to make it around the track. But I think it does a great job where Formula Day sometimes gets bogged down and sometimes when there's a leader, they have no problems getting around the track because there's no one you know, in front of them, and sometimes they get really far away, and usually games of Formula Day take way too long than they should. This automobiles game that I played, Mark, is very interesting. Well, it's a bag builder, and it's the same thing as Cubitas. You're buying these abilities, and it's feeding different colored cubes in your bag, and you're drawing a certain number out, and the cubes do what they do, you know, moving along different colored parts of the track. The problem that it does is it introduces these sort of wear points, these brown cubes that you put into your bag. And it, and it almost, you know, takes away that whole racing element, you know, that, you know, sort of, sp- you know, speeding up and, 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 you know, gradual, you know, going faster and faster. But no, these, these, all these brown cubes come out and you actually have to skip a turn to get rid of them. And they just bog your bag up and it takes you right out of that, you know, racing element. I really wanted to like automobiles when I played it a few years ago because I really like bag builders. And I thought that it was a novel approach to racing. You know, you have these different colored cubes that correspond to different levels of the track. But in addition to the problem with wear that I had, which I, it was generally unfun, and it was the game you were drowning in wear and uh, a lot of it. And sure, mitigation of bad things is part and parcel of many a deck builder or a bag builder. But I, I felt that it was a little miscalibrated. I also really didn't like how it leaned into another problem that deck builders often have, which is you need the right combination of things at the right times. So it's not so much about hand management, but it's just hope that your deck spews out your random hand that you need, whereby you'd be in a certain position and you just don't get the color of cube you need to advance properly. And well, so much for you. Yeah, it was... I was getting beat fairly badly the whole race until like the the last turn. I zoomed around and got one space ahead of him at the end to win. It was, it was bizarre and unfun. Well, at least it offers the opportunity, unlike Formula Day, for come from behind wins. It's true. Which is another thing we'll go back to to Cubitos as well. Let's start with Cubitos. It's a a huge dice chucker because all you're doing is is 
buying more and more dice and it's much like uh, couriers where uh, they have a bunch of different sets of dice and each set has a, a variety of cards that can go with them. And I didn't take a big look at the rule book, but there are some set tracks that you can do or some set matches. A lot of them. And I'm sure that you can just do random as well. Absolutely. And uh, it's very interesting and has all sorts of uh, decent powers, none of which that seem overpowering. And we saw a nice variety. Like the first one was pretty well, you know, standard, you know, increase your movement, move around the track. And then they go all in on the second track, which was combos upon combos. Okay, you need these two dice, you know, if we, you know, with these two other dice, and this will get you another dice, which will trigger off this other combo. And I don't know if our game reflected this, but if you didn't follow what the cards wanted you to do, then you weren't going to win if someone was doing what the cards wanted you to do. It is possible that there is only one way to build your collection of dice in that particular scenario. I don't know. We don't have enough experience. No, I'm saying it with the one with the one play, it did seem that way. Uh, sure. But as you commented, it really did go from zero to 100 in the context of a couple of quick scenarios. I'm always a little bit leery of following the preset scenarios. We've talked about this before. The early scenarios are sometimes aggressively dull. So it was a little bit of misgivings that I set up the recommended first setup. But I was pleasantly surprised that there was still enough there. The thing that I really appreciated about Kubitos was, since you're not randomly pulling the dice that you have, there's a certain amount of hand management. There's a certain amount of control over what you're rolling and when. And as a consequence, that allows you to build the hand you need, whether the setup is combo heavy or not, in either case. And you can either kind of have fallow turns where maybe you even want to bust, and that dovetails very, very nicely with the, with the push your luck element. You can keep throwing dice until you roll all misses if you have already three dice showing hits. So before you have three hits, you can just chuck away with a bend, and then when you have three S, start worrying, looking at the dice you have left. But there's a compensation element for busting. Sometimes you want to bust. Sometimes there's incentive there. There was a there was a very, very nice come-from-behind element. The leader of the first race won the first race, who was in, in, in front the entire time, but there was considerable leeway made from the uh, runners in the rear. In the second race, there was a there was a come from behind victory by virtue of someone exploiting combos, whereas somebody else wasn't. I was very pleased. I've I've not had good experiences with John D. Clare games. Probably my favorite game before this that I played of his was either Custom Heroes or Space Space, but neither of them I thought were spectacular. I really don't like Mystic Veil. Vale. I really don't like Edge of Darkness. I really don't like how AEG has basically decided that John D. Clare is their golden child, and they'll publish anything he produces, it seems. He's very prolific. Some people really like him. I'm not one of them, so it was with as I say, a fair degree of trepidation that I tried Kubitos, but I quite enjoyed it. As far as Push Your Luck is concerned, it's not much of a racing game, really. It's more like you're scoring points. and Oh, for sure. It's Like I said, you're getting around the track, but eventually you're going to have to get around there. Yes. And it does uh, a lot of things that these other racing games don't where there's spaces on the board that will actually you know help you get those combos going, either, you know, culling out, you know, crappy dice or getting more money to buy better dice. And it's all shortcuts and, and, and traps and waterfalls. And it's, and it has an interesting uh, catch up mechanic as well. You know, it's all sectioned off and depending on how many sections the leader is away, they get you to roll more dice. And it's not this huge thing, but it's a small benefit for the people that are behind. The one thing that I really didn't like about Cubitos, and it's a mild complaint, but the rest of the game is so smooth and simple, it, it actually is quite bad. Your hand size, at a minimum, is 9, and can very frequently get up to 11 or 12. And it's actually a little tedious to count out 12 dice. It's not easy to eyeball that, at least not for me. I can't look at a pile of 12 dice and immediately say, oh, that's 12, unless they're arrayed up in rows of 3, 4, or 6. But... So every turn, you're like, okay, I've got three dice over here. I guess I'll pull two dice over here and then three. Eh. It reminded me a little bit, and this is high praise, of the quest for Eldorado by Knizia, which is also a deck builder with racing elements. And with Eldorado, you're not really running. Typically, you're not running in either in a loop or sometimes it's a straight line, but sometimes not. I think I prefer Quest for Eldorado because there's a little bit more notion of blocking that you might have in traditional racing games. In Kubitos, there's no blocking at all. So that's one of the reasons why I say it doesn't feel very much like a race to me. Also, the theming is in Kubitos is so absurd that I can't even find it delightful. You're cube-shaped animals running a race and you're building a support team consisting of, like, buying dice representing cheese people? I, I don't get it. Right. It's one of these things where they literally wrote 
the theme to match what was going on in the game. Not one of these things that sort of, he's like, well, this sort of, you know, let's make this interesting story that sort of encompasses what's going on. No, we're going to go line by line what you're actually doing and makes no sense. Let us not discount the vague possibility. I don't want to impugn the character of Mr. DeClaire. I don't consider this to be actually impugning character at all. Possibly he experimented with the psychedelics, came into the office one morning and said, all right, all right, all right, all right. This is what I saw. I saw a cube shaped sheep being cheered on by a, by a fish that was disguised as a llama. And they're like, sure. And everyone's taking notes. It, it makes sense. Thing I didn't like was the setup. They have these ridiculous boxes that all the dice are kept in, which during gameplay are fantastic to actually set up is a hassle <laughs> and a pain. It's like, you know, try to open the box without ripping the box open because it's not super thick cardboard. And it's got the hook mechanism that is used to hold boxes closed when you want them to stay closed, but should not be used in this particular time. And yeah, it just leads to a setup that takes five times longer than it should. Five times? I think so. Five times? If you just had the stuff in bags and just had, you know, the dice sitting beside the cards, it would be dump, 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 and you're ready to go. Not this, you know, slowly peel open each box. Maybe. Put it in your hand. You're convincing me. Try to close the box. Now try to fit everything into the top of the box. So anyway, what we're saying is these little boxes has this neat little, you know, cup at the top, and it has the dice on the side printed on what's the faces. So that's very helpful, very nice, but exceedingly tedious to set up. Considering the weight of the game. Five times too long, Walker says. Five times. Yeah. uh, Mentioning the weight of the game is appropriate because it is very nice. It's quick. It's breezy. I I find it enjoyable. I I really like the push your luck. I think it's it's quite well done. And the way that it combines with the possibility of other dice playing off of how often you've busted and perhaps preventing busting. I'm looking forward to seeing what the other cards have. Now, if they continue to be driving you down a particular set of combos, that's one thing to keep an eye open for. But honestly, given that it is a race-type game that is uh, very quick, I'm happy to give it a shot. Because as I constantly say, far too many race games I've played over the years have just been too long. Too long, too tedious. And that is Cubitas by John D. Clare and put out by AEG Games. And Automobiles by David Short, also AEG. And Mark, what did you play this week? Got to play Raw. I felt remiss, actually, when discussing probability last time for not mentioning Raw, because Raw, I think, is probably the game that involves sort of probabilistic push-your-luck in the way that I most like. It's one of my top ten games, has been for a very, very long time. And when I think of games that reward an ability to sort of eyeball what the situation is tactically with respect to what other people have purchased, what you need to purchase, what resources you have available, what else might come out of the bag... What might be left in the round, a sense of timing, a sense of nuance, a sense of playing the other players, what they're apt to pay for and what they're apt not to pay for. Raw does it better than all of them. And that's one of the reasons why it is my absolute favorite auction game and really a a, a past masterwork. We talked about Medici a couple weeks ago. And again, I, I like Medici. I like it fine. But in certain ways, it feels to me like an early draft of Raw. And so I was very glad to go back to Raw, and we played with five players. A number of people will refuse to play Raw with five players, and I respect that, because Raw with different player counts feels very different. Most people agree that it's best with three. Some people will only play it with three. I think these people are losing out. And with four, it's a little chaotic. With five, you really have to be willing to take risks, and you really have to be willing to snatch up opportunities when they present themselves, and accept the fact that you might have to pay a nine or a ten sun for just a couple of tiles, and then a low-value sun in the middle. I'm reasonably certain that I neglected to explain the game properly because the module doesn't load everybody starting with ten points. And I'm half convinced now that when I said, oh, everyone starts with 10 points, not everyone took 10 points at the start of the game. And so now I feel very guilty about that. No, no, I think we did stop uh, like uh, two tenths of the way in, one fifth of the way in and rectified that situation. Are you sure everyone took 10 points? Well, we talked about it and everyone was taking points. So not everyone noticed that, you know, half the table. I feel bad about Walker. Was taking points. It's been haunting my dreams. Well, to go back to the probability part. I see an angry Egyptian chicken god squawking about 10 points at at me. When you sleep at night? I I see that all the time. No, no, no. In my waking waking life. Oh, your waking life. These are waking nightmares. Yeah. Check your dosage. Getting back to the probability and chicken tiles, I think. That would be the one thing you'd have to know is how many chicken tiles are in the bag and keep an eye on how many chicken tiles are are leaving the bag so you can sort of know what your chances are. Because I think that's the biggest, you know, gamble or thing to know about. 
And that's all I have to say about Raw. Fantastic game. Would play it anytime. Yeah, there's going to be more talk about Raw later on when we talk about the news in terms of what Knizia games are in print and which Knizia games are not in print. But one of the things that really makes me feel like a curmudgeon, like nothing else, is listening to Eurogamers who got into the hobby. I mean, Raw had had been printed many years before I got into the hobby. Well, not many years, but Raw had, had it was not a new release. Well, that's what I have here. Under publisher, I just left it blank. Just take your pick. <laughs> they probably published a, a copy. No, it. it's only been a couple. Like, Alia, <laughs> Uberplay, and Fantasy Flight slash Plat Hat are pretty much the only ones. That's but, quite a few. Okay, sure. That That's a fair number. But <laughs> Raw had already been a few years old when I entered the hobby. And I feel, I honestly feel bad for people who enter the hobby now and don't get to experience some of the things that I would consider to be the must-plays in terms of Eurogame. And I realize this makes me an irredeemable elitist curmudgeon. I accept that. But when it comes to a certain number of mainstays in the hobby, of which Raw, Modern Art, well, probably all of Knizia's auction games. Okay, so now I'm expanding it. What I initially had in my head was a list of maybe three or four designs and I got a balloon to do about 20. So maybe I should abandon this topic and say that's all I have to say for now about Raw. Raw, El Grande, Tigers and Euphrates... <laughs> Maybe Hans and Tanaka. So many. So, we have a stream. I'll go more on about it in the news. But we played Holler Tau by Uwe Rosenberg. And we played with the advanced deck. <laughs> and it was very advanced. I, I like how it advanced everyone but me on the score track. <laughs> this is a game put out by Lookout Games. We played on Tabletop Simulator. Uh, just, I love every play of Hollertau. It's got the very interesting planting system where, you know, it keeps track of how many crops you have and the level of the crops and how many, how much stuff you're going to get. It's got this, you know, action selection slash card play that is incredibly balanced, you know, when you think about how many cards are out there and is super fun to play. I really enjoy Hollertau. It's, it's great. It's- yeah, I, I can't think of... I can't think of anything to knock it. It's just all around good, and the and the implementation is good. Well, some people, it was observed by Warm Boy at the end of the playing that there is the possibility for you to engage in some relatively risky, low-cost moves that could pay off hugely. So if it's near the end of the game, it's a six-round game, if it's in round five or six, and it just so happens that you can spend one or two workers, which near the end of the game is not a substantial proportion of your workforce, to get an endgame scoring card. It is conceivable that you will just happen to draw a card that fits exactly with what you happen to be building up towards. Because generally speaking, you get not an ironclad recipe. It's not it's not locked in like the combos in Kubitos might be. But you get a sort of general guidance like, okay, well, if I can get a fair amount of hops, I can activate this card, which will then let me feed into this other thing, which maybe then I can work towards this other resource. But if it just so happens that you've been accumulating sheep throughout the entire game exogenously, and in round five, you randomly pull the card that says, have 14 sheep. We call this the the ticket to ride syndrome. And we've talked about many games that have this problem, right? Where you, you know, dip into the the pool of victory point conditions and say... Hooray! Yes, yes, yeah. that's true. I personally, since it's not an, a smart move to plan for that to happen, I'm not particularly worried about it. Well, at least not in my perception. I don't claim to be an expert in Holler Town. I'm actually not even very good at Holler Town. But it's not something that I would ever do. I, I tend to try to draw the point scoring cards in rounds two through four and then work towards them rather than hope to, to, to stumble into them. Because usually by rounds five and six, I've got bigger fish to fry. And I'm, I'm just worry, work, worrying on satisfying all the other conditions. But it, I could easily see how some people would choose to do that often. And if you're in a group where that happens, then it is not inconceivable to me that pure luck of the draw will determine who wins. Well, it seemed while we were playing that you were talking about there was some discussion that moving your cottage was not the good strategy or something? Among the cognoscenti. This is why I don't read strategy articles on Board Game Geek or Indeed Anywhere. Among the cognoscenti, they're like, well, you know, I've played Holler Tower 200 times. And it has been my observation during the last 80 or so that advancing your college, uh, your cottage is a sucker's play. And I'm like, that's interesting. I should never read these articles. <laughs> I was going to say, it gets you like more. I, I don't see that because there's the victory point payoff and the extra action payoff. I just, I don't, I could be, I'm not going to say anything. Well, I, I, just, I don't think the claim is that you should never advance your cottage. You need to advance your cottage to get some workers. But then if you're advancing your cottage past 12 to get those points, gotcha. the claim is that it is probably better for you to gobble up as many endgame and other bonus cards as possible, and that is apt to be more lucrative. I do not know if that is true. All that I know is that I have a great deal of fun playing Hallow Tau. It seems to be, in the playings that I've had, to be a reasonably competitive, balanced experience, 
and that is not how I play Hollow Town. So that's fine. I mean, it's it's an Uwe Rosenberg game. Even even his more narrow focused Uwe Rosenberg games, they're not all sandboxes like Feast for Odin. But even his relatively focused ones, there's a variety of different ways to skin the cat, as you were, and for other colorful animal related idioms, might I encourage you to check out our stream where we discuss various things you can do to sheep. It's all PG rated. Don't worry. And that is Hollow Town by Uwe Rosenberg. We played a game called Regicide. Regicide is a review copy we got from the one of the designers, Luke Badger, and his company Badgers from Mars. It was designed by Mr. Badger, Paul Abrahams, and Andy Richdale. And we talked about this in Pledge of Indifference when it was up on Kickstarter because I was struck by the fact that this was a Kickstarter project for a game using a standard 52-card deck of cards. They were releasing the rules for free. But they were nonetheless kickstarting uh, the, the design of their own unique custom deck that wasn't necessary to play the game, but would have neat artwork. Step the first. Allow me to comment on the artwork. I adore the artwork. I think it is fabulous. It's really cool. I'm going to be using this deck from now on for any fantasy-adjacent game that requires a deck of cards. So specifically, Rangers of Shadowdeep, absolutely 100%. There are lots of games, lots of open source games that increasingly require a deck of cards to use. This is going to be my go-to for now on. It's very, very cool. Check out the art online. I thoroughly recommend it. Every card has unique art. It's not one of those decks of cards where it's like only the face cards have unique art. They all have special art. There's like a theme that kind of connects the suits together. So all the club's characters look like they're damage dealers, which is how it works. Anyway, and it is also a co-op game. What did you think of the game? I thought it was fantastic. It had this very interesting system where all the face cards would pop up as bosses and you had to play cards to damage them and play cards to defend yourself. And every suit had a different special ability. And you really had to think about not only the boss that you were fighting now, but one that was coming up next or maybe later and it was random. He's okay. Well, we've already killed, you know, the club and the diamond. So the next one's going to be the spade or the, you know what I mean? So it's okay. Well, we better get our card drawn now yep. or we better, you know, cycle more cards now. So I, I can't wait to play it again. Really enjoyed it. I played it solo and I found it intriguing, but incredibly frustrating because the only way you draw cards is by playing diamond cards. You don't draw cards otherwise. It's one of those cases where I really would have uh, felt that I think that rule books need to emphasize instances where they subvert normal patterns of card play. We talked about this in the context of Guards of Atlantis, for example. In Guards of Atlantis, there are no line of sight rules. In the first edition of Guards of Atlantis, they don't explicitly say this in the rule book. They just talk about targeting people at range and don't and neglect to mention that there are no line of sight rules, nothing blocks line of sight. And so you see endless questions about, okay, well, presumably I can't fire through characters or blocking terrain or tokens. And every time they'd be like, no, we, we didn't say anything blocked, so nothing blocked. Similarly, in and this, this this was possibly me just being stupid. In Regicide, I'm like, oh, you have a hand size, but you don't draw up automatically at the end of your turn. The only way you draw cards is by activating the special power of the diamonds. Interesting. But when you're playing only one-handed, you have eight cards, and it can be easy to run out of the diamonds. I felt it was a little bit weird. But with multiple players, namely we played it two-handed, suddenly it's this marvelous cut and thrust between, okay, now we need to heal, now we need to draw cards, now we need to do damage, now we need to protect. Oh, by the way, most of the time you feel like you need to do all four at once, and so you really have to very carefully triage. Now, it's one of those co-op games where you're not allowed to talk about the contents of your hand, and there are some times where the game is clear about what kind of communication you're allowed, but most of the time you're not allowed much communication at all. And all things being equal, that is not my preferred form of co-op. I would rather at least be able to talk about some things and collaborate with my partner. That's not to say that there was no collaboration. There were these interesting turns where we'd bat things back and forth, hoping that our partner had the just right card to make the really optimal move. And nine times out of ten, we were gravely disappointed in each other and in ourselves and generally in the state of the world. And the optimal move is interesting, right? Because if you kill the boss with exact hit points, uh, not only do you kill it, out of the deck, but it doesn't go out of the deck. It's going to come onto the top of your deck that you draw from. Now it's one of the cards that are in your hand, and they do tons more damage than your normal cards, so it's like sort of like deck building in a way. It's beautiful. It's fast. It's clever. It, it makes innovative use of a standard deck of cards. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm, I, too, am looking forward to future plays. And that is Regicide, not to be confused with Regicide or Regicide. Right. Because there are three on Board Game Geek. It's true. Two of them from 2020. This is the other regicide. <laughs> Speaking of games that can be played with a standard deck of cards, this one you might have to shimmy it a little bit. But anyway, 
Long story short, it's on Board Game Arena. It is coming out soon. It is called Jekyll vs. Hyde. And this is another game that's sort of like uh, Fox in the Forest. It is a two-player trick-taking game, but this one you're going against each other like the original Fox in the Forest. This is designed by Geo Nil and put out by Mandu Games. So in this one, there are only three suits, and one person plays Jekyll, the other plays Hyde. Jekyll is trying to keep the the tricks even, so both sides are winning the same number of tricks, whereas Hyde is trying to tip it in one way or the other, because once all 11 cards are out, the difference in the wins is how far Hyde is going to move down this track, and Hyde's trying to get to the end of the track, and Jekyll is trying to keep him from getting there after playing three rounds of 11 cards. And the way Trump works is very interesting as well, because it comes out as as the order of those three suits are played. So if someone leads purple, well, purple is going to be the weakest. And then and once a green is played, then you know red's going to be the best. So it goes purple, green, red. And then there are these potion cards that sort of mix that all up because each suit also has sort of like a an ability hmm. where if it's played with a potion, it'll trigger that ability. So green is if a potion is played with green, you have to exchange two cards. If it's played with uh, a red card, then you clear the trump suits and you have to reestablish them as you play cards. And purple is steal your opponent's one of their tricks. So I think this is going to be a fantastic game when it comes out. I've been having tons of fun playing this. And if you need a two player card game, this is the one to check out. It's on Board Game Arena. Or you could just read the rules. And like I said, you could modify a standard deck of cards. I don't think it would be that difficult. I'm looking forward to trying it. Jekyll vs. Hyde, put out by Mandu Games. I played a solo game of The Magnificent. The Magnificent joins a long lineage of games that thinks very, very highly of itself, along with games like The Great Dalmudi. Any game that has the cojones or the grabnas in Nausicaan to call itself The Magnificent knows it has some big shoes to fill. And I'll say that the solo mode for The Magnificent I don't think shows it off to its, uh, to its best because... There are certain aspects of the traveling action. There are three different kinds of actions. You can travel, which is your traveling circus, so you travel as your traveling circus. You can build tents in your traveling circus, or you can launch performances in your traveling circus. So it's got a little bit of shades of Princes of Florence in that. You're building buildings to satisfy requirements to put on performances, which then earn, earn you a bunch of points, which is vaguely reminiscent of the Princes of Florence. But I would say it's most reminiscent of Pulsar 2849, the dice drafting game by Vladimir Suki that came out a couple of years before it. It feels very, very, very much like Pulsar 2849, which to me is a good thing because I very much enjoyed Pulsar 2849. But The Magnificent is much quicker, much more straightforward, and much more dynamic in terms of the scoring conditions because the way that it works is you pitch all the dice, and those are the dice you can draft. Every time you draft a die, you allocate it to one of your cards, and each card gives you a bonus for action selection on the top and a scoring condition at the bottom. At the end of every round, you score one of your cards, you move on to the next round and get a new card. And so you're both trying to put on these performances and maximize your scoring potential on these action cards that you have. And it's really neat. I found it very, very pleasant in terms of doing those trades off, uh, trade-offs. It was very quick as a solo experience, and I, I imagine with more people it would obviously take much more time, but I uh, suspect it would be very quick moving because the actions themselves are very, very simple in nature and very straightforward. So I'm looking forward to seeing how it's going to work multiplayer, which I guess now is as good a time as any to say that this is what we're going to be streaming this Saturday at 10.30 EST because, because there's a tabletop simulator mod, and having played with the physical version, I can actually report that the tabletop simulator mod seems more usable in that it is not quite so dark. Some of the artwork and a lot of the Art Nouveau styling of the fonts I quite appreciate in The Magnificent, but overall it's black on black on black with subtle gray overtones. And it's very, very grim in nature as a result. A lot of dark colors, and it's a little bit brighter on the tabletop simulator mod. So it's like brass. Yes. The color scheme is very reminiscent of bra Brass in a number of ways, which is mystifying. Brass at least had the excuse that they wanted to represent the grim nature of Industrial Revolution factory conditions, as opposed to the Magnificent, which is supposed to be about, you know, the grandeur of carnivals and such. I mean, granted, they're mostly at night, but anyhow... Uh, so, The Magnificent was designed by Eilis Fenson and Christian Amundsen Ostby, 
And I quite enjoyed the, the solo play, even though I said a number of the elements didn't quite seem to work as intended when playing solo, or at least they didn't seem to come out to full effect. Like, for example, I only traveled a couple of times over the course of the entire action selection. Most of the time I was just building and then performing because the the traveling, I feel, would become more interesting once there are more players that are pushing a variety of... of they're, they're basically rondelles, and I was never in a position to push it much farther. But other people being around, then we might get a little bit more interesting. So I'm looking forward to that. Very, very promising. Very keen on The Magnificent. I got to play Champions of Midgard on Board Game Arena. It's an alpha. We got through a whole game with very minor bugs. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Could you start over? I fell asleep. It is a interesting little push-your-luck sort of game where you're collecting dice and you're, and you're maybe uh, fighting monsters that you shouldn't. But oh, that sounds exciting. You just really need... Uh, Need the points and or the the bennies they give. Uh, Did you say Champions of Midgard? Is it Norse themed? I love Norse themed games. This sounds great. <sighs> I had a lot of fun playing it. <laughs> so did the person I was playing with. I'm glad. I'm sorry. I should stop giving Champions of Midgard <laughs> such a hard time. And it it really made me feel how fantastic the expansions were. The one where you get uh, a leader die and the extra boards you can go to. And even though I had fun playing just basic Champions of Midgard, it really made me want to. Get my copy to the table again. Champions Midgard by Grey Fox Games. With great pleasure, I can report that we have returned to The King's Dilemma. Now, this is a multiple of five episodes, so we're going to mention that we have a Patreon. We have a Patreon. One of the things we put up on the Patreon is a Patreon-exclusive show, which was first The Cure Chronicles, which was our show talking about our campaign of Pandemic Legacy Season Zero. We have finished up Pandemic Legacy Season Zero just in time, too, for yet another shutdown in Ontario. And the last episode of The Cure Files will be released shortly to the the Patreon backers. And so we were looking for a new campaign game to go into. And one of the options was to return to The King's Dilemma, which we hadn't played in a very long time. And Dewey, to his credit, was willing to jump in. We'd only played three games before, so we didn't miss much. But I was surprised... I, I was I was pleasantly surprised by two things. Like I, I I remember how amazing the King's Dilemma is and how much I love it. I think it was the best game released in 2019 by far. But I had a couple of misgivings. One of them was I didn't really remember a whole lot about what we had done in the previous games. But the moment we started going through the cards, Huey and I especially were like, "Oh yeah, remember that vote where you did that terrible thing?" And I'm like, "No, no, no, I remember it differently." And we were just telling <laughs> these stories about the various things that we'd done over the course of the game, and then. My other concern was not everyone really takes to negotiation slash politics slash talking games. And to be entirely frank, we've discussed this before. You are one of them, Walker. And Dewey had expressed some mild reservations, but he was willing to give it a shot. And the moment the game started, he jumped in with both feet and he was immediately arguing policy. Half the time he was arguing from his game conditions. Half the time he started role playing his house. Sometimes we couldn't tell which was which, which is part of the appeal of the game because it's pulling you in a lot of different directions. And you, <laughs> you were great because you would show up and every time Huey and I would be like, this policy makes perfect sense. You'd be like, well, have you thought about these possible follow-on conditions? And we'd be like, no, no, it's not going to, is it, is it going to blow up in our faces? No, no, it'll be fine. <laughs> and immediately we were all arguing in the best possible way and really immersing ourselves in the power dynamics of these policies and the consequences of this world that feels vastly more compelling than pretty much any other campaign game I've ever played. We've talked about this before. Gloomhaven is a wonderful combat system and a wonderful combat system and and a, a good sense of leveling up, but you don't really get invested much else beside that. The King's Dilemma as a competitive experience, we literally can't comment because we don't know what the final victory conditions are. We suspect they're not going to be particularly satisfying. And I think that's part of the charm and yes. part of why it's so good. Is I agree. It's sort of like in the background and you know something's happening and I, I don't think anyone is going to be particularly upset if they didn't win. Right. And we compared this favorably to Shassen, right? When we were playing Shassen, what I wanted Shassen to do the politics game we talked about not too long ago, was give me the same sense of pulling me in different directions. Like, okay, well, I realize that in terms of numbers, as a competitive experience, I really want to answer A, but in terms of a variety of other thematic, narrative, or personal factors, I really want to answer B. Ha literally about a quarter of the way through the game of Shassen, B never materialized. I was like, I need to get these bonuses, so this is how I'm going to answer these questions. 
in part because there was just no sense of permanence, no opportunity to let any of these conflicts breathe, no opportunity for other people to weigh in on these various policy decisions. The King's Dilemma is the exact opposite, where simple trade policy, a simple question about whether or not you should be buying things from a neighboring kingdom, immediately leverages a whole bunch of different things. And sometimes those things are related to competitive advantage. But as you say, sometimes because how the game is set up, you can just let that go to the background and let it be motivated by your house's background or personal animus or whim or what have you. Or, or I just don't want that guy to win. So I'm Precis- going to vote, vote against Precisely. Him. This is how I feel King's Dilemma is going to pan out at the end. It's going to uh, develop into a fantastic story and it's going to come to an amazing conclusion. And then as soon as that happens, there will be an argument and a a talk about who got it there the best way and or <laughs> help develop to get it to this this result and then whoever wins that argument regardless of the points or whatever the game says the person won is going to be the person that walked away the winner of that game you know what i agree with you because in terms of bringing ourselves back up to speed about what had happened over the course of the game what i remembered the most was who had managed to do some of the most pivotal decisions over the course of the game. And in that sense, Huey so far is the winner of our game, despite the fact that on paper, he doesn't have many of the so-called points. Anyway, so if you want to follow a more spoilery version of the personalities and the decisions involved in The King's Dilemma, we are going to be launching our new sub-show, titled as of yet uncertain, Jester's Boil. I don't know. That's not bad, actually. <laughs> I'm a little acronym happy, but uh, that, that that might be good. Anyway, and so we got back into The King's Dilemma, and we will be playing many more games of The King's Dilemma going forward. And then lastly for me, I played a game for your benefit, so you wouldn't have to, a game called Conspiracy Abyss Universe. And I'm talking to the listeners. This is a, a game that's done by Bruno Cathala. It's done in the same Abyss they use all the same artwork. It's your, I'm a, I, and that's all I'm going to say about it because I, I, I was the one that had to play it and I took that hit for the listeners and I, <laughs> I will, I will not have to tell you about it. Don't, don't. What was so bad about it? Come on, give us a little it, bit of detail. It was literally you build this pyramid and you match up colors and they give you benefits. And if you have a big block of red as opposed to purple as opposed to green. And if you play this card, then it'll let you switch two cards around and then you had a pearl. Uh, table and a key table. And when you played those cards, those tracks went up and you'd get those points. It's just, it just seemed like a whole bunch of nothing. Okay. It was, it was painful to play and, and disappointing Con- considering Abyss was halfway good. Well, and, and Bruno Catala is usually pretty reliable. Yeah. Just this is not, not his greatest work in my opinion. It is published by Bombix. Check it out, but don't. <laughs> And those are the games we played this week. And now on to the news and why it doesn't matter. I have a couple of quick Kickstarter things because I don't remember what I say here and what I say on Pledge of Indifference on Patreon. So Simon launched Marvel United. If uh, you missed out on the first Kickstarter of Marvel United, lucky you. But if uh, you really like Marvel and you want a very light did I say light, Mark? I want to make sure I didn't Eric, mispronounce light. Eric Lang, one of the designers, describes it as a light lifestyle game, which I think is an interesting way to characterize it and probably pretty accurate. So if you want a family game and you are into the Marvel universe, this is actually a good game. It's nice and simple and you beat up the bad guys and you beat the boss and you have fantastic looking figures. But other than that, I don't think it has... That being said, there is a, a Infinity Gauntlet, you know, big boss thing. There's all sorts of different expansions that we have yet to try. Hence the lifestyle version. Yeah, yeah. But, but base game, very light, not very fulfilling. I had, I was surprised. I've been surprised by what order stretch goals get released in for both Mythic Battles Ragnarok and for Marvel United X-Men. Last time I checked, they'd already gone to a couple million bucks, but they hadn't yet done Gambit in Marvel United X-Men. Has that changed? Not that I, I've only read through it once, and this has the weird thing of they specifically talk about split shipping in this one. Well, at least they acknowledge it, yes. So you can pay double shipping, I guess, to get the base game right away and then expansions later on. Yeah, no, there's still no Gambit. Did I did I miss something? Is he not? He, I guess he's not cool. He's not cool anymore. Well, he was never that cool. He was always a little rapey, but... Yikes. <laughs> okay, and the second 
bit of Kickstarter news is Frostpunk. Not that it's huge news, it just seemed odd to me. There, I've seen many different templates how Kickstarters go. It's like you you pay it all once it 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 funds, or you get a message later on saying you know here's the 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 pledge manager, and you may add or not add stuff, but that's when they add the shipping, and then you pay immediately. Then this was just a random day we've decided to charge your credit card now for your shipping and your extras it was like when we did the pledge manager it's like you know when when we charge your card this is how much we'll charge you and this was just like today we've decided to do it so i just thought that was well that kind of weird it's my game found right so unlike uh indiegogo indiegogo charges you the moment you pledge kickstarter will charge you the pledge oh no frostpunk was was kickstarter oh really yes oh well then I stand corrected. It was Backerlit, so that was their 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 backing system they used, and Backerlit just decided to say, "Now we're going to charge you for your shipping and hmm. the add-ons that you added." Well, that's unfortunate. It wasn't. It wasn't terrible. Like for, it just was lucky that it was you know mid month, so it was no problem. But, right. You know, it could have been. So there's been a lot of commentary lately on the role of board game criticism. Through a strange vector, through a strange entryway, and that's largely because there's been some discussion both from Plat Hat and from Grail Games about the status of reprints, and more specifically, the, the role of prominent board game reviewers, and I said prominent, so obviously it does not include us, on the role of driving sales. Specifically in the context of Plat Hat Games, a few weeks ago announced that they were going to be terminating their quote-unquote Euro Classics line. They'd been intending to reprint Princes of Florence, which I think was a bit weird. Princes of Florence wasn't terribly great when it was released, and I don't know why some people are particularly fond of it, but they'd been reprinting Knizia's up to this point, Samurai, Through the Desert, Tigris and Euphrates, as well as Raw. Now, the good news is that Raw is going to be reprinted by 25th Century Games, who's also doing a reprint of Tutankhamun, so it's going to be back in print soon, and we don't know a whole lot of details, but it's going to be back in print. And Grail Games, who had published Yellow and Yangtze, as well as republishing a number of Knizia titles like Circus Fulcati, as well as Medici, doing the most recent publication of Medici, has announced that they're not really going to be doing that anymore. They're, after their successful reprint of Fjords that was kickstarted, uh, they basically said that they're still going to try to do reprints, but basically saying not a Knitsy Games anymore. So Stevenson's Rocket, which they'd reprinted, and Yellow and Yangtze, which they published for the first instance, are going to go out of print after they sell their current print run. And this has caused a lot of, as I say, navel-gazing about the role of driving sales. And without being too unkind, basically what ba- both of them said was, if you reprint a classic Euro game, Shut Up and Sit Down isn't going to review it, so there's not going to be any money. And this led to a whole bunch of accusations and counter-accusations about who reviews what and why. But the good news is that Raw is still going to remain in print. That's the, that's the good news. I do not ad- ad- adhere to the uh, specious argument that if a game is good enough, it will eventually get reprinted. I can think of far too many good games that are out of print and who have been out of print for many, many years to rebut that claim. And it also seems vaguely like the old claim of the Rainmaker. It's like, well, the rain will come eventually, and when it does, they'll take credit. Or, you know, the baseball field. You know, if you build it, Mark, they will come. Precisely. But it is a bit of a shame to me, as I said, as a sort of elitist curmudgeon that some of the, 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 the canon classics in the Eurosphere aren't perennially in, and reliably in print so that people who are new to the hobby could have a place to go. And so when people, again, like me, who are like, well, you know, these are the things that you should really get started with. These are definitely the, the, the heights of the genre. I don't object to the sort of periodic model. I don't object to Kickstarter. I don't object to, 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 to stretch goals and buckets of plastic and things like that. But in a universe where, where El Grande and Raw are hard to come by, that, that makes me a little bit sad. I'm also looking forward to the reprint of Raw be, that's going to be put out eventually by Dice Tree Games, the Korean publisher that did a beautiful edition of Winner's Circle and a marvelous edition of Modern Art. So suffice to say that there's a lot of room in publishing for the perennial classics as well as all the new stuff. I'm not particularly uh, convinced that things like Through the Desert and Tigers and Euphrates are going to be out of print for long. I hope they're going to come back soon. Uh, but suffice to say that I, I, I will offer one minor capper to the whole, well, if, if certain people don't review us, we're not going to move sales. To a certain extent, that's the media environment that Asmodee created. I find it a little bit rich when Plaid Hat, which up until recently was an Asmodee subsidiary, to bemoan the fact that there's only a very, very small number of influencers that can move lots of stock, because Asmodee does not send review copies to many people largely to the ones that they complain about. So 
it's a little, as I say, it's a little bit strange for them to be complaining about the media landscape that they themselves helped create. Asmodee complaining about consolidation is a little bit like crocodiles complaining about predation. That's all I'm going to say about that. And I'm going to probably have more to say in an episode of Survey Wrong about all the games are like or bad about the role of media criticism and the influence of market forces at a later time. But just for now, just to report that Grail Games and Plat Hat are getting out of the old Knizia business. And last thing for the news, we've already talked about this a couple times already. We do a stream every Saturday at around 10.30. This week is going to be uh, The Magnificent at 10.30 Eastern. And for those people who have, have gone to Twitch and not liked what they've seen, I can guarantee you that uh, we will not be dancing. We do not have any crazy, you know, uh, pop-ups on the screen. Uh, the stream will start. We play the game. And then the stream ends. <laughs> Occasionally, we talk about Domjot. Domjot. Ooh, man. And, and that's all it is. We don't, uh, you know, celebrate followers or we do engage with uh, the people that are watching. Well, we celebrate followers in the sense that if people yes. show up and have things to yeah, say, we respond to them. But I'm, just saying, I'm just saying that we, we yeah, we don't. We, lo- we love our followers, we, Walker. We don't dance. Both of them. We don't dance around. Anyway, this being said. <laughs> I have no idea what you're responding yeah, exactly. to. Exactly. Sure this, is, this is what, you know, I watch other streams mm-hmm. just to get some information and to, you know, to try to improve what we do because I want to see what people uh, enjoy consuming. And then I've just come to – this is why I'm just having this small segment. I've decided that I don't want to do any of that. <laughs> we are going to continue to do what we are doing. We will do different than other other streams. We will play the game and then we will end the stream. We won't have like a 20-minute buildup trying to hit these different tiers of something. I'm just so sick of it. <laughs> And that is the news and why it doesn't matter. I feel like I should be nervous about blowback, but I don't know about what. <laughs> <laughs> so our feature game this week is Dominant Species Marine by Chad Jensen and GMT Games. This is a review copy we got from the publisher. Chad Jensen sadly passed away a couple years ago after a bout of cancer. He designed Combat Commander, which for my money is one of the best war games uh, ever put out. It is a roughly squad level World War II game that can cover a dizzying array of different types of nationalities, especially after you add in the Mediterranean expansion that was released, that produces tremendous narrative flavor and texture. More on this later. Combat Commander Pacific was released a couple years after that, and his first Euro design was Dominant Species in 2010, All again, all put out by GMT. It was a bit of a departure for Chad... Jits at the time, who'd only done war games. And GMT has put out Euro games in the past, but it's certainly not their core set of offerings. Following it up with Fighting Formations the next year, and he's released a number of other Euro games with GMT, like Urban Sprawl, and uh, he's basically been a little bit all over the place in the best of possible ways. So, Walker, why don't you give us an unhelpful summary about what one does in Dominant Species Marine? In Dominant Species Marine, the card game, you have a shared hand of five cards, <laughs> which you take turns playing to get a random amount of victory points. Now, I've heard that there's a sideboard and some map or some silly thing, but it really doesn't matter. There's a place to throw your action pawns to keep track of whose turn it is to play these cards. And then near the bottom of the deck, there's the game is over card. And then... You find out who played the best cards and whoever played the cards the best wins. So this is a redevelopment of Dominant Species, the aforementioned 2010 game. And I find it interesting that some properties, their natural recourse for the sequel is to go underwater. They did the same thing with XCOM back in the day. XCOM 2 was Terror from the Deep. And they're doing the same thing with the crew. First you, first you go to space, then you go underwater. So it's just like the people that did Evolution. They did a game right afterwards that is also underwater called Oceans. It just seems to be a trend. So over the course of the review, I have more experience with Dominant Species than Walker does. And I'm not going to mention much about the card game, Dominant Species, the card game, because it was just a different kind of thing entirely. And first off, one of the big differences between Dominant Species and Dominant Species Marine, which had somewhere the obnoxious tagline, like Dominant Species, only wetter, which it's, it's definitely a tagline. Dominant Species was two to six players, whereas Dominant Species Marine is two to four. But there are also much more substantial gameplay elements, and we'll get to those as we get to them. So let's talk about the cards. Oh, we're going to go right into the cards. Well, you meant, you, you, you flagged it right away, so why don't we start with that? Uh, so there's a, like I said, there's a common, uh, 
common hand of five cards. It's not are, a hand. There's a, there's, a, <laughs> there's, a, there's, a, there's a common set of five cards that are down the side of the board. Yes. Uh, there is, I don't know, would you say two thirds? Two thirds of them will score you victory points. A fair proportion of them will. The, the, the big, pro- the big problem for me with the cards isn't so much that the cards can have a huge impact on the game. It's that the cards range from negligible impact on the game to here have 20 points. Or something along those lines. Well, Not thought, out of nowhere. You have to build towards it. True. I want to flag something, too. Because I thought afterwards, because we had talked about this after the the first game, and I said, okay, well, I'll try to play the game differently without you. And then I realized, no, because the only other way to get victory points is go to the, go to the space that lets you play a card. Right. So I was just like, okay, well, why don't we just double down on, on this and, and make it so it's the only way for you to play this game? <laughs> Many of the cards are hugely consequential. They can eviscerate your board position. They can disgorge vast quantities of points, 10 or more. There's a small handful of them that do that. Uh, Some of those cards might get replayed by virtue of a card that lets you replay a card or something along those lines. And then there's a whole bunch that might get you somewhere between four to seven-ish points or things like that. It can safely be not ignored, but you don't have to plan your entire game around them. And that is honestly one of the things that's so jarring to me about Dominant Species Marine, as well as the original Dominant Species. The, some of the some of the really, really swingy cards were definitely in there. You have to build towards them, which is fine by me. But in that sense, you almost kind of have to know what some of these cards are, a la Twilight Struggle or a la Blue Moon to name a couple games that I thoroughly enjoy that rely on that foreknowledge. And then you have to hope it comes up at the right time. Because this is one of the changes between Dominant Species and Dominant Species Marine that I think is unfortunate. In Dominant Species, at the top of the round, you would see the available cards, everyone would place all of their workers, and then when it came time to execute cards, you'd execute cards. So you get to do all your worker placements with the understanding of what cards were available. In Dominant Species Marine, if somebody triggers a card, what that does is it'll leave a space open in the tableau and a new card will show up. And then someone might be able to trigger that new card on their very next placement. Right. And the other players have no way to respond to it or to try to stop them or or to try to cash. Because some of them are everyone scores points if you're in these particular places. So you could like say, okay, that's fine. I'll uh, quickly get to these other places and we'll share the points. But you don't even get a chance to do that. Right. And... Normally, I, I'm willing to forgive a certain amount of that level of chaos and opportunism if you can kind of cover your flank and prepare for such eventualities. To a certain extent, you can do that in Dominant Species Marine, and you can start to recognize those possibilities on repeat playings. Does it ever fully get to the point where I feel like, aha, you have capitalized on a well-crafted plant? No. It doesn't ever get to the point where I'm fully okay with someone being able to pounce on that card the moment it comes up. And so it leaves you feeling a little bit dissatisfied with the results of the game. This is going to be... And this is one of the other big differences between marine and previous dominant species. This is going to be solidly, you know, 30 minutes per player. So 90 to 120 minutes with three or four players once you know what you're doing. So vastly short of the dominant species. But these huge swings of points don't ever really sit well with me the way they felt okay in Dominant Species. Dominant Species was like a three-ish hour game easily much of the time, which was too long for my taste. But when somebody scored a whack of points, I could at least recognize and say, yeah, I got outplayed. That was, they saw the card, they built up towards it, they played uh, appropriately, and by the time the entire round executed, they were able to capitalize on it. Those are the awesome cards of Dominant Species. So this does share a lot of things with the original game. You have all the binomes that are there and all the different species and they uh, thrive in different, in different biomes. So it all has that, but it doesn't have the same feel, like I was saying earlier today of, you know, of, you know, bringing your species out into the world and sort of trying to get them to, you know, get a hook on, on the, on the land, right? Before, because in dominant species, there's, a very big chance that you'd lose everything, right? If you didn't plan it out properly, because, you know, uh, you know, land masses would be severed off and there's a lot more removal of, of the binomes. Whereas here, you never had a problem. You knew you're always going to be somewhere. You just had to like sort of spread out at the right time. It was more opportunity, you know, grabbing opportunities when, you know, quick, fast point grabs as opposed to dominant species, which was, I think, a more gradual sort of feeling of actually inhabiting the earth. Hmm. So I agree with you that dominant species feels more gradual. And let me, let me just highlight why that is because 
the 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 central difference in terms of the action selection between the two they're both worker placement games but in dominant species everyone would place all their workers and then the action spaces would execute in a specific order whereas in dominant species marine the actions execute immediately and it's part of the growing trend of euro games where you either place a worker or you recall your workers Nothing special happens when you recall your workers unless it's a cycle when everyone has recalled their workers and there's a board reseed. But there's an interesting place your worker aspect to it, whereas you have to put them in a certain order. So it starts at the top and you can't place any of your workers unless they're your, they're your special workers uh, above your already placed workers. So you definitely have to plan out your turn and do things in a certain order unless you have to leap in somewhere and either A, stop someone from getting points or B, get them for yourself, thereby missing out on all the earlier actions. It's very much like Egizia. Egizia was a worker placement game where you could place anywhere you wanted, but you were never allowed to go earlier in the river. And Dominant Species Marine has the same idea. And that tension of wanting to go to the lower spaces, but knowing you can't get back to the earlier spaces, and also knowing that all your opponents are working under that same constraint, and not knowing which one, who is willing to jump down and do a very, very suboptimal move long term, but very good ter- good move short term, that part I really liked. The action selection, and the way that it dovetails with these special pawns that are not limited, limited by those restrictions, I thought was really cool, really satisfying, and it really helped up the pace and make things feel more visceral. Because one of the other reasons why Dominant Species tends to be so much longer than Dominant Species Marine, one of them is they just have a shorter deck. The deck is the clock, and in Dominant Species, you don't remove any cards. In Dominant Species Marine, you by default remove 10 of them. And so by default, then you're going to have a shorter game. But it just takes longer when you're placing all your workers and then resolving them all, because people just forget what they were going to be doing with the rest of their placements. And so it's just a little more procedural and stentorious in nature, as opposed to much more reactive and dynamic. But going back to the geography, because you mentioned some things about geography and how you felt that, as a result, Dominant Species Marine felt less like your species expanding and your your types of animals going across. I'm going to have to disagree with you there, because another salient difference between Marine and Base Dominant Species is Marine has more of the map already set up at the start of the game. There's a land mass to the north, there are open oceans to the south, in addition to the core tiles, which is how things used to work exclusively. And I actually kind of liked the tactical puzzle of when are you going to expand into the new hexes, namely the unoccupied ones that are already there but unoccupied. Who's going to make the effort to make them habitable so your species can thrive there and start slowly expanding for either the points or the extra scoring opportunities? Which people are just going to take the risk and expand there before their species can thrive and risk losing them all due to an extinction event? That part I thought was kind of cool. Now, it tended to proceed out roughly the same way in every game, you know, the the slow expansion north and south, but I appreciated that it was there. And then on top of that, it had this survival aspect of the game where there was these events in the south and the north. And if you had area majority in those, you got the survival card. And then whenever a survival scoring came up, you got bonus points. Yeah. And again, this is one of those differences where I, 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 this is one of the differences where I actually prefer the base game of dominant species because they had icebergs. Basically the ice age would come and, and, and make things uninhabitable. It was harder to keep your species alive on icebergs in dominant species due to a variety of subtle rules changes. I actually felt that sitting on the vents and just staying there was a little too simple for my tastes. And it turns out to be a steady income of points based on how the game works. And so once you got there, it was a little bit hard to dislodge you, as opposed to dominant species where it was always slightly more risky, I felt, to sit on those icebergs. Now, I want to lean back just slightly quickly because we talked about these bonus pawns that you get. I thought they were very interesting. There was like the very last space you would go and you'd sort of add up if you had like a a solid, you know, sun type lizard or, you know, we're good in the water or you're good in sand. And then you got a bonus pawn. But not only were you able to put this and break the rules of where your pawns could go in the last space of every action, it also had uh, different abilities. You'd make that that ability even, uh, you know, more useful, advanced versions of the actions. And you could eject other players' pawns and other actions. Yeah, that part was great. And that's how they use dominance in this version of dominant species. In the original game, it was almost invariably the case that a very consequential game state would fail to be updated because you constantly had to update who was dominating each hex every time and it was tedious and i never played a game where it was done correctly the entire way through in dominant species marine you only have to check dominance 
when someone takes the dominance action, and then it's not in a hex, it's based off the entire board, which is actually simpler to calculate, believe it or not. And so the way that that handled, and the way that it introduced these special cool new pawns, I thought was really cool. I really liked it. And then the next thing I want to talk about is the player powers. At the beginning of each game, you got a small hand of these special ability powers, and you got to pick one, and it made you different than everybody else. And I thought uh, some of them were very interesting, but some of them were borderline useless compared to others. So I thought, I thought overall they were very good. It had the same, did they? Yeah, they had the same sort of uh, food chain order that I like that they had in Dominant Species, depending on who you took. It broke all ties and also set the turn order, which I know you had a problem with. So. I, I just felt that in the base game, it was okay because the turn order was constantly reasserting itself. Whereas in Marine, it applies once. And so you're just losing ties for area majority the entire game, but you only got to go first once. That's That was my only minor quibble with it. And I think it sets up fairly quick. Like you said, it has the you know starting tiles printed right on the board. You put out a couple chits, deal out the cards, and you're ready to go. And it's way shorter than the original and plays fairly quickly. So I prefer Dominant Species Marine to the original Dominant Species. Again, there are some elements of the original game that I prefer. But overall, I really, really do like the new action selection mechanism. But... Unfortunately, the biggest casualty of that is that it really leans in to the impact and sway of these cards that come up. And yeah, they're going to be a considerable source of points all by themselves in many instances. And even when they're not, a lot of the other points are going to be related to the actions that lead to the trigger of the cards in the first place. So you want to be able to camp on those high value uh, tiles and or those tiles that let you trigger cards really well. And if you have a combination of that and you're able to jump on the spaces you're going to be able to, to, to rake it in, possibly in ways that are not entirely satisfying for other people to reply. Now, again, I'm, I'm far more forgiving of that in a 90 to 120 minute experience than, say, a three hour marathon of Dominant Species, because I always felt that Dominant Species was too long for what it was. But ultimately, when it comes to games like this, I, I feel that in particular a game that it suffers quite badly to in comparison is El Grande, to be frank. El Grande is an area majority game where similarly you have these cards that come out at the beginning of the round, but then you bid on being able to activate those cards. And there's an opportunity cost in terms of activating the cards that you really want to activate in terms of being able to place fewer cubes. And so you get the same, the, some of those same kinds of trade-offs and some of the same kind of cut and thrust without the sense that, oh, well, this card came up and there was nothing I could do about it and it's just gone and out from under me. And similarly, I, I when it comes to worker placement, there are other games that combine worker placement and area majority in ways that I find slightly more satisfying. One that springs to mind is Empire's Age of Discovery, which actually shares the older dominant species style of first you place all your workers and then they all activate, but it doesn't bog down because a lot of those placements are just much more straightforward and it's, 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 you're not going to get confused as to what your overall plan was. And quite frankly, if I wanted to play a worker placement game where I was constantly killing everyone else's workers, I'd be happy to play something like Argent the Consortium instead. Because, so, I mean, there's a lot of clever stuff going on in Dominant Species Marine, and I really do think it's an advancement. But at the end of the day, uh, I, I'm happy to play it. I enjoyed it. But the wild swings of the card just make, prevent me from taking it too seriously or, or really engaging with it in a more substantial way. I agree. I think when there's a game, I think in this game, while you're explaining the rules, I think you do need to emphasize how important the cards are and when you have to do that then you know there's a slight problem but like you said if someone was very eager to play this i'd be more than happy to bring it to the table again but i don't think i would ever choose it so that's going to do it for so very wrong about games thank you very much for joining us if you'd like to get in touch with us you can reach walker via his email just roll the dice at gmail.com you can reach me mark bigney on twitter at the games you like for more public discussion you can find the so very wrong about games facebook page or you can check out our board game geek guild which is guild number three two three six and you can find us on patreon we read everything you send us and we'll get back to you if we can thanks again for tuning in and we hope to see you again soon peace You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Bigney. Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time, and always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong.